All right, thanks for coming, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, the slide here kind of gives a synopsis of what it is that we're going to go over. I'm going to cover a number of things, uh, sort of an unusual combination of uh, the nuclear testing in the 50s and 60s and how it can actually tell us something about the age of various marine organisms. Um, so this is sort of a little synopsis here on the screen. And uh, I was fortunate enough that last year to go to a couple of meetings. I went to the Sharks International meeting in Durban, South Africa, gave part, part of this presentation to that group. Uh, also, um, since I work with radiocarbon, I'll get into that a little more. I went to this um, the first meeting of uh, radiocarbon in the environment in Belfast, Ireland. Uh, started a couple of nice collaborations there. And then, um, believe it or not, there's actually an entire symposium dedicated to fish ear bones. So the entire week on otoliths. It's crazy. And so for some people, they'd be like, I'm not, I'm not interested in any of this. And for me, it's a challenge because I'm interested in every talk. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. So this, this was actually in Mallorca um, in Spain. So the thing I like to do is I like to kind of poke at people a little bit to sort of see how, you know, how long do you think fish live? I mean, does anybody have an idea? I mean, if you're educated about it, don't say anything. Um, but, <laughs> you know, like, well, like when I do the theater here, I, I usually uh, give it just a quick pro, uh, uh, quick rundown on, on how long fish live. But um, typically what people think about is the goldfish that they own. You know, they they kind of think that, well, you know, my goldfish lived, you know, five or six years, and so probably most other fish live that long. Well, it turns out that goldfish can actually live quite a long time. Maximum reported age is about 41 years. Uh, so that's quite a commitment from the uh, the collection at the, um, the circus, right? Um, koi, some people think koi, you know, there's some stories about koi being around for a really long time. Hanako was said to be 226 years old. It was passed down from generation to generation. Probably not true. Um, the oldest reported fish is around 40, 50 years old. Uh, other people will cite things that look sort of prehistoric. The, uh, you know, sturgeon looks old, looks ancient, and it is an ancient lineage, but uh, it also looks like it probably gets to be pretty old. It's actually true. It can be reported up to about 152 years old. What they typically use is uh, the fin ray right here tends to build up stacks of rings just like rings on a tree. Um, maximum validated age is somewhere on the order of 70 or 80 years. So how do we age fish? Um, using trees as an example. Um, basically, you can cross-section a tree, especially in temperate zones or where, where the seasons are are extreme and you can get nice solid growth bands. Um, but you have to count them and so you got to count the bands and it requires interpretation and validation as necessary. And you can see if you look carefully here there's quite a few of these bands actually split. So you know what do you actually count? How do you actually come up with the accurate number? So validation is necessary even for something that is, in, is as intuitive as a tree. With fish we can use scales. This is probably one of this is the earliest kinds of estimates of age. You can use the circuli in the scales to get estimates of age. This is the vertebrae. Um, you can use vertebrae in the teleos fishes, which is the bony fishes, or you can use it in sharks. I'm actually going to get into that a little bit. This is a nice x-ray from Niwa in New Zealand. Um, some fish, the only thing that they've been able to find with the lingcod is the fin rays right at the base of the dorsal spine. They get these nice little growth zones here that have been validated. So there's plenty of ways to do it. But by far, the most common is using otoliths. And over time, they've been used uh, in various ways. You can kind of see these circular structures going out all the way around the edges here. And initially, they were just counted in that way, doing surface-type aging, looking at the zones that were visible on top of the otolith. But uh, in the 70s, they just started um, sectioning the otoliths. And this is a transverse section. And the estimate for this large fish was about 100 and 150 years old from counting growth zones in the section. And here's what this looks like. Um, this is from a similar species, yellow eye rockfish I worked on. Um, so this is the cross section of just the whole otolith. If we zoom in on this area and expand it up to this square, you can start to see structure that looks a little bit like a redwood tree, right? Zoom in on this and you can see even more, real fine increments. And when, they, when these were first discovered, um, the initial estimates for, um, for yellow eye were about 26 or 30 years old, but that was from counting it on the surface of the otolith. Uh, once they started sectioning them, they're getting, you know, 60, 70, 80, even 100. Uh, estimate from this section is about 107 years old. So in, initially, there was just complete disbelief. There's no way these fish could get to be that old. So validation, once again, is necessary. So are these 
So are these zones annual is really the question. So why is this important? Um, how fish grow over time. So here's the fish, fish age and the fish length. This function is called the von Bertalanffy growth function. Shows how they grow when they get up to a certain size and then they just tend to get older. Uh, this is a very important part of, of stock assessments. So the fish that got me out here, um, I'm originally from Central California. I did a lot of work in Monterey at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, uh, but from there was doing a lot of inter international work. And one of the last contracts I had while I was operating my uh, age and longevity laboratory was with the federal government out here to do the Apacapaca. And what we're dealing with here is, is we really have a, a data poor fishery. Um, a lot of fisheries, they're bringing in a lot of fish and, and the federal government goes in and subsamples them. And so they have decades of fish odalis or, or uh, other structures to make assessments over time. Here it's pretty tricky. The fish comes in and it disappears to the market. So it's very difficult to get samples. So in steps uh, age validation with bomb radiocarbon dating. So the earliest estimates, so these are the von Berlampi growth functions from several different papers. You can see that the growth curves from some of the earliest papers show them getting really big, really, really quick. So five or six years is the maximum age. Um, and then here's some more moderate growth curves that come out. And the estimate, the pre maximum predicted age was about 18 years, but there's really no basis for that at that size. Uh, it was based on an extrapolation of the early growth into the largest fish. So really the question was for the largest fish, which are typically between 700 and 800 millimeters, so you got you know, fish that are getting to be about this big, um, how old are those fish? We really need to age those fish in particular. So in steps, nuclear bombs. <laughs> so <laughs> this, these uh, horrible things that we did in the 50s and 60s um, have actually created an interesting marker that we can use, and I'll show you all about that in a second. Um, so these thermonuclear detonations that happened in the 50s and 60s reached megatons of TNT. So these are massive explosions and they basically created a radiocarbon signal that went around the world, created an atmospheric signal that worked its way back into the oceans. And I can find that signature in various marine structures that are conserved, specifically coral. So corals growing at about a centimeter per year on average in most places. That's actually a nice representation of the marine chemistry through time. And we can actually find the bomb radiocarbon signal in the corals. Oh yeah, so this is the Castle Romeo shot. This is one of the bigger ones. So 11 megatons, quite a large, large shot. So how big were these explosions? This is something I, I kind of added on just recently because I'm doing some work looking back at, at all the test periods. Um, I have a coral core from Guam. So we're going to, the, the federal government's been uh, given charge of that area to try and regulate the fisheries and we want to do bomb radiocarbon area in that area. Turns out there's no coral record to reference with the fish. So I've got this record that shows three big spikes and the radiocarbon basically came straight from these events. It's actually really interesting. It's not averaged out. It went straight to Guam. So I've been really looking into details of how big these bombs were. So here's the first test. This is Operation Crossroads at Bikini in 1946. Uh, this is the Able shot. Um, down here is a whole fleet of ships. This was airdropped. This is the equivalent in size uh, or magnitude is about a 20 kiloton event, similar to in Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima. It's actually the same design as the bomb, uh, as the um, Nagasaki bomb. Here's another shot. So this is actually from down the way. So this coral, this is the coral fringe and it goes actually way over to here. Uh, this is probably from the beach over on that far side. So this is the one that most people are familiar with. This is the Baker shot, the second one in the Crossroads series. You can see the ships really clearly here. These are um, a lot of a lot of the ships were from the Japanese fleet, and they basically put them in there to test them. And, and then there were some older ones, older U.S. ships that were put in there. Notice also there's um, bands on the tree here, so that when they take pictures, as the wave comes washing back up on the shore, they can actually get measurements for it. So, uh, and it's, uh, this is kind of a neat shot. This is somebody went in and colorized this, and I think they did a really good job with it. Another shot, this is the Wilson chamber effect. This is basically the negative pressure wave that causes this big um, cloud to form. It's just before this, this is where it's fading out. But I like this because you can actually see the size of the ships here. 
and then this is actually much later. You can see the water curtain is sort of dropping back down and creating a massive wave that is much, much larger than these ships. So this is just 20 kilotons, 20 kilotons. How this works is this is a, a, the fat man device. This is what was dropped on Nagasaki. This device is basically you have shape charges. So the charges that are used to blow up buildings that direct the force through steel. That's where a lot of this technology started was here, was, was actually being able to direct the force in on this shell of plutonium. And the compression of this shell to this, this is sort of a spark plug that is in the middle. It's pl uh, pl uh, polonium and ber uh, beryllium gives uh, uh, helium nuclei and neutrons to actually get this thing really, really going big. What this looks like is if you have plutonium, if it's sort of separated far enough from itself where it's, it's not fully reactive, then it's not critical. But if you compress it together to where all the neutrons are used up and they, where one gets absorbed by another, so then you get two more, so you get this cascade effect, uh, then that's what actually creates the bomb. So you get super criticality here in the, in the middle. And that's why they have this hollow sphere. So the plutonium is actually separated enough so it doesn't see itself as so much, but then it's pushed together and then goes up. So the Mike shot was actually the largest shot, uh, the first thermonuclear uh, device that was detonated in 1952. It was a theoretical um, attempt. And let's see, okay, this reminds me. So what I, I wanna take a step back. So this is the fireball. So with the 20 kiloton device, um, I'm gonna have you do a little exercise here. If you hold out your thumb about like this, okay, hold out your thumb. And that's, that's how tall a 300 foot tower would be at two miles. Okay, so in the Nevada desert, they tested a whole bunch of 20 kiloton devices and there were actually people out there in a number of these shots. And so, so this is what the guys would see. So they could see this, the, the tower and then they would have their eyes, of course, protected. And imagine that within an imperceptible amount of time, a basketball appears. That's the fireball from a 20 kiloton device. He's at about two miles away. This device was 10 megatons. This fireball is three and a half miles across. And this is within the first few milliseconds. So that guy that's standing looking at, the, if he was there, he'd be almost in this thing, right? It, you wouldn't even know what hit him. So these things are just, are really, really uh, big devices. And I think the scary thing is that, you know, a lot of them are still around, right? Was this in Wetuk? Yes, so yeah, Mike was on, on Wetuk, yeah. So uh, here's how this works. I mean, this is, this is a Teller Ulam device. So we've got the original plutonium implosion device here, and it's in this really thick container. And this is a, another, um, <coughs> this is a fusion device. So when this goes off, this container contains the explosion, compresses this <coughs> structure, which has um, fusion material, which is basically lithium deuteride in this particular case. It gets compressed just before this whole thing flies apart. A little tiny bit of sun is made here. So fusion happens right there. <coughs> that's where you get this massive amount of energy. And that's what created this giant cloud here. So here's before. <laughs> so here's the island. So this has got all the detection equipment, this line that goes across here. There's the island where, where the mic uh, structure was. It was actually this huge shed. It was not a deliverable device. It actually weighed several hundred uh, tons in total. So it's purely a theoretical device. Here's after. Basically, the entire island is gone. This hole is about <coughs> two kilometers across. Here's another shot of it. So basically vaporized a huge area, two kilometers across and about 100 meters deep. So a lot of stuff went up. So here's an example of how the cloud changes and what happens with the cloud when it goes up. So you've got your relatively small devices here. This is the 20 kiloton devices, which are typical. Um, this is all in the troposphere. As you get up into the tens of megatons, you start to get into, you start to go through the troposphere into the stratosphere. And this is where the whole signal gets circulated around the earth. So the early stuff, the smaller bombs created regional signals, but this is where we started creating a signal that I could detect in the oceans. So what does this have <laughs> to do with fish, right? <laughs> How does this help us at all? 
Well, this signal was created. Here's the atmospheric response. Here's the succession of, of nuclear events going up in time. And then basically had a hiatus and then they lit off a bunch of bombs because they knew they were gonna stop the testing. And then uh, some people violated the, uh, the treaties. Um, but you can basically see we got this real strong pulse and then it's dropping back and that's the atmospheric signal. So that worked its way into the oceans. How it looks in the oceans and Hawaii coral is a good example. These are all different corals, uh, one's from Kona, one's from Oahu, French frigate shoals. Uh, Rourke is also from the main Hawaiian Islands from Kona. This is a combination of these records and you can see that this, the response is pretty much pretty similar across the island. So pre-bomb, rise in radiocarbon, a little higher for French frigate shoals, a little lower for the main Hawaiian Islands. So how we use this is it turns out that the fish ear bone is the same as coral. So the, the carbon that's in the water that is diffused in so that this, this nuclear signal gets diffused in with normal CO2 gets diffused in and it gets taken up by the gills and gets put in the otolith. So the marine chemistry that you get from the otolith is the same as what you get from the corals. So I tap out this little teeny tiny little pile right here. This is actually a dentist drill bit and uh, it's run by a computer that uh, is computer controlled and so I get about three milligrams worth of material and when you're in there, when you're in the same room, it sounds like you're at the dentist. It's just like, <laughs> it brings back horrible memories if you've ever been in that position. Um, so I take that little tiny piece pile of powder and we send it off to Woods Hole. We've got a contract with them and they have a, a, an AMS facility. This is an accelerator mass spectrometer. So it's a very expensive facility to run. So typically you don't have one yourself. You send it to a facility that has people that are dedicated to running it. And it's about 300 bucks each, $284 each to run each little pile of powder. So I got to make each one count. <laughs> so here's the, um, so I'm going to show you how the fish stuff worked out. So here's the sort of uh, grayed out uh, coral record with some oceanographic data to show the post-bomb decline. And like I said, it's a direct comparison of the, of the, uh, the otolith carbonate with the uh, coral carbonate because it's basically d dissolved inorganic carbon that's coming over the gills. So here's what we got for the opaka paka. These are, X's are plotted. This is, these, these are each individual fish and this is the collection date. Okay, so that was when it was collected. We know that's when it died, but that value doesn't belong there, right? It's, this is from the core of the, of the otolith. So therefore you have to project it back and that's how you get the fish age, okay? So you see, these are really diagnostic, right? There's very little question about how old that fish was. You start to get up into here, then it becomes tricky and those are almost, almost useless. And if you get it down too low, then you can say, well, it was at least this old, but it could have been a lot older. So, so the utility is definitely very limited. So here's the growth curves again. Um, they had, so some of the, we thought it was a more robust early growth. It was from uh, counting daily increments in the otolith. So this is the early growth that was extrapolated up to about 18 years, but they didn't know, well, how far can we go beyond that? We don't know. Here's the radiocarbon data that we got. So it fills in, you can see it actually goes out quite a bit further. I got a couple of fish that were over 40 years old. And that was a big surprise when I did this. This was just the feasibility study that I was doing um, to, uh, which eventually, you know, twist my arm, give me a paycheck out here. <laughs> so I've been doing this work ever since. Um, so, so it changed, changed a lot of things. So the stock assessment had to be redone, uh, you know, because now the potential productivity of each individual is much, much greater. It's 20 plus years more. So this is published in, oh, this is the other work that I was doing, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> just <had> to, <laughs> like, does that journal exist? <laughs> uh, Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences is where this was published. And I've actually got some copies up here in the front if you guys want some. Uh, my cards are there too, so if you're interested in any PDFs of any of these, I can send them to you. So uh, moving on to other things, so you know, uh, the snappers are sort of deep, deeper water uh, fishes, but I'm also doing work on reef fishes. Kala here in the Hawaiian Islands, which is the blue spine unicorn fish, um, the hump, or, uh, humphead parrotfish in uh, Guam and Saipan, and then the, uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, the bumphead parrotfish. I'm going to focus on the bumphead parrotfish. These are really neat fish. I mean, they used to get up to two meters long, uh, but they're pretty rare in that case now, but they used to be very, very large. So, you know, what's, what's the longevity of these things? So here's their otolith. Um, so here's a section. So this is the whole otolith. That's an adult, uh, younger adult, and then that's a juvenile. 
this is a section going through one of these, but it's one of the, one of the larger ones. So you can see all the, look at all these nice little growth bands there. So you can actually count out to about 40 years for that. So for this fish, we had some estimates of age. With the Opaka Paka, there were no growth zone counts. You could section the otoliths and you really couldn't see any good bands. So those radiocarbon values that I had were actually completely independent of any other kind of estimate. But with this fish, we kind of wanted to show, uh, you know, does this actually make sense? So for the radiocarbon work, I used this little guy right here. You could see this is within the first couple of weeks to a couple of months of life. And you can see it's sort of nested right in the top here. So I knew that when I was going to go in, I'd, I'd better extract the right amount of, or the right carbonate. If I extract it from some other part of the otolith, I wouldn't really know, right? Um, so I want to make sure that I, I get it right in the middle. And this was a little bit challenging. Um, here's the largest otolith. So here's where it's mounted. It's kind of uh, glistening a little bit because it's in the uh, uh, this mounting matrix. Little pile of powder. And then there's the little core that I extracted, which is just a little bit smaller than the juvenile. And then there's the leftover. And this is the smallest bit that you can possibly get. So before, after, powder extracted. And this is actually a 300 micron bit. So that's 0.3 millimeters that I'm using to get that carbonate. So it turns out here's a, the familiar structure, pre-bomb, rise, post-bomb. These are the three potentially oldest fish. And so this is projected back. The little square actually means the, uh, that's the, the number of counts that they were getting from the otolith. So you can see that one of them is pretty much spot on. These are maybe a little bit under age, but could be within the variation of the coral record too. These guys up here, it's not so straightforward, but at least they're consistent. They're younger fish, but they're consistent with where they should be. So it turns out that, the, that they do get to be 40 years old, and that was not the largest fish. They were much larger fish. So shifting gears a little bit here, um, the work that I've been doing with sharks, we use vertebrae, and we're finding that they live to be a lot longer than originally thought. With large shark species, there's a real problem with understanding their life history. Um, they, they tend to have late maturity, which means somewhere on the order of teenager or maybe 20 something is what they estimate for some of these larger sharks. Low fecundity, which means they have only a few pups. And this is a prime example of that. The sand tiger shark is adelphophagous, which means that the babies eat each other. <laughs> it's literally survival of the fittest in mom. And so they have one or two at maximum every one to maybe three years. So that's interesting, isn't it? So short lifespan, low fecundity, late maturity. It's like, wait, what? Short lifespan? Why would these things mature so late and then only live five or six years? That, that that's their potential um, reproduction. So it's really counterintuitive that they live such a short time once they're mature. So very likely the problem is, is underestimated uh, age and, or lifespan. So how we do this with sharks is uh, uh, you got to have the vertebrae. So this is the whole this is the whole vertebrae. And there's another one next to it here. If you section this, it looks sort of like a couple of V type structures. So this is the upper part, and if we had the whole thing, we'd have another V down here. But you can see the growth band structure, right? So you can kind of count that, and, and it looks fairly easy. But yeah, you know, it's like well, you know, someone else looking at it, you get a couple other age readers in the room, and they're going to interpret it differently. This is actually this is actually one of the better ones. But we need, so we need to validate that, right? So we need to use the radiocarbon uh, method to try and do it. But this becomes tricky because the source of carbon here is different from the otoliths. Otoliths was dissolved in organic carbon. It's coming over the gills. It's directly from the ocean. This is all metabolic. This is all what they've been feeding on. So it depends on what the dietary sources are, <laughs> right? So depending on how much 100-year-old uh, scotch uh, Captain Quinn has been eating here, you know, or drinking. Um, so, so it really depends on their uptake of carbon and, and how does that change this, the, the signal that we should reference. It makes it much more tricky. So here's uh, the sand tiger shark. So here's the same, same vertebrae I showed earlier. This is a much larger shark. Pretty easy counting all the way out to here and then it kind of goes, eh, yeah, I don't know. It's it tricky. So we look for the bomb radiocarbon signal in this structure. Now, the nice thing about the sharks is that we have, we have a continuous record. With the, with the fish ear bone, we only have the core to deal with. They grow much more slowly over time, and it's tricky to get a signal later in the otolith. So we tend to just do the core of one fish, and we do the core of another fish. But with the sharks, we can actually go from birth, birth year, 
down here. This is probably the birth year right there. And then actually try and sample through time and hopefully maybe find the bomb radiocarbon signal to give us a, a time specific marker. So here's a, so, so the um, sand tiger from the Atlantic coast, the east coast. So we have a, a Florida coral and a Bermuda coral, pre-bomb, rise, and then post-bomb decline. So this is our most in sync reference for what was going on with radiocarbon in that environment at that time. This example here from the poor beagle is an interesting sort of phase lagged and attenuated signal. So some of these fish in here are, are real young fish, so we can't slide them over and line them up. We know that there is a, a slight phase lag and a, and a definite attenuation to the signal because it's, it's basically metabolic carbon. Um, so that's sort of our scenario where we can think, well, where does the sand tiger sit? So with the sand tiger, we had a whole series of relatively young sharks uh, from like two years up to about 10 years old. This is plotted based on where they were captured and then going back in time uh, relative to the estimated age. And you can see they all kind of fall out pretty much on the coral record going a little bit lower. And up through here shows us that they're much more in sync with the coral record than this signal that the, that the poor beagle was getting. It makes sense because the poor beagle go in and out of the surface water. They feed deep and they feed shallow and they feed deep and they feed shallow. So there's going to be this mix of, of carbon that's in sync with the, the mixed layer, which is more in sync with the atmosphere. If you go deeper than that, you get an old signal that's depleted in radiocarbons. So it makes sense that it's phase lag. But sand tiger don't do that. They stay up on the shelf. They stay in the mixed layer. So they're feeding on stuff that's going to be pretty much in sync with the radiocarbon signal from bombs. So we use those as a reference. We figure if we have an adult that lived through that period, it should be lined up with that. Here's the adults, way offset. So it turns out that the way to do that, the way, that, the way to actually age these sharks, these adults, is to shift them over to alignment. And in order to do that, we have to add 11 to 12 years to the original age estimate. Basically, we've shown that they do get to be 30 or maybe even 40 years old. Does that make sense? Follow? Any questions? I'm open for questions at any point. At the end of the day, I have made some. <laughs> to, uh, at the end of the day, can you say that each rain estimates a year? Yeah, so in this case, so here's where, so with the with the sharks that were up to about 10 years old, right. you could tell that they were pretty much in sync, right? But beyond this, I'm not sure what's going on, right? So we figure that we've got either really slow growth going on out here, and that, that maybe the rings stack up, or there's no growth. And this is only somatic growth. It's, it's basically on the, based on, once a shark gets to a certain size, then why is it gonna make its vertebrae any bigger? Otoliths are kind of a special thing. They actually do tend to get bigger and bigger, even though the fish is at its maximum size. So then from that point on, once, once you don't see the regularity of it, it's more an educated guess. It's yeah. On the year. Yeah. Right. So this means that any kind of production aging for this species, they're going to have real problems with it. So the, the take home message with, with, with this species with, was that the potential longevity definitely exceeds 30 years. The original estimates were on the order of 20, 22, maybe 24 years. Uh, we have data from South Africa with a couple of, couple of sharks that were exceeding 40 years. Um, so the, the concern about, about a short adult lifespan are, were correct, that we've actually got um, much greater productivity, more, adding more than 10 years to the potential productivity of, of each individual shark, which is good news, you know, because then if they stick around, you know, it doesn't mean that, they're, that you're dealing with a senescent population that's just going to disappear. So... Um, you may need to deal with, you know, if you're going to have a fishery, minimum and maximum size limits, very similar to what they do with sturgeon. There's sort of a slot in the middle. Once they get big enough, you let them go. If they're too small, you let them go, right? So that might be one way to actually manage this fishery. So this is published. I've got a copies up here also. It's not in the zombie journal. <laughs> um, oh, and I got the cover. Um, so that image I designed, they, they like the, they like the image. And so I actually got the cover of the journal, which is really nice, sort of fun. So, uh, other work that I'm doing, I'm working on, uh, sea turtles also. The, um, uh, the hawksbill sea turtle has nice thick, uh, uh, scutes, which is pretty much what planned its demise because they use them to make all kinds of clips and things out of them. 
Uh, so here's a, a skew right down here. This is a cross section from the one that's way down here. It's way down, way down on the back. Um, so you can see we're extracting these little little lines, and so from most recent material here to the oldest material there, and we're finding we're getting a similar signal because this is once again metabolic carbon. Right. Other work I'm doing, I've done some work on abalone. This has led to doing some work on uh, pearl oysters from Pearl and Hermes Atoll. Um, that fishery was fished out in 1928-29. Basically, they came in, uh, Japanese came in and just completely wiped them out. Uh, uh, not sure who it was at the time. Uh, the fishery was shut down in 1930. They went back, these shells were collected in 1993, and they, they were still really sparse. So it shows that there's something going on there, and I think that it has, has, may have something to do with that these, these guys can actually get to be really, really old. So I'm working with some folks um, that radiocarbon meeting I was telling you about that I went to in Belfast, teaming up with people at ETH in Zurich and the IM Eames Physics Lab, and what they've got going on. So I sent them sections. This is a, a laser that's been burning across the section here, and they're taking little puffs from each spot. So it keeps going all the way across. And so what we're looking for is kind of like with the, um, with the shark vertebrae, we're looking for that bomb radiocarbon signal to see if they are in fact that old. So, so far it looks like it's working. And I wanted to put in a little plug for Pluto. We're like <laughs> one day away. I've been following this for quite a while now, nine and a half years and three billion miles. And we are one day away from uh, closest flyby. So if you're interested in this, just type in new horizons in Pluto and Pluto and you'll get an update on it. It's pretty, pretty cool stuff. The closest ever to Pluto is tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, fly by, they're going to go whizzing right by it. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Question. Yeah. Okay, um, I think in general, fish live long. Why do you like salmon? It's a well, it's, yeah, it's, it's an evolutionary process, right? I mean, they, they sort of fit into a niche that uh, requires that kind of life history. So um, not all fish live really long. There's quite a few small fish that only live a few years. Um, but it's this massive, I mean, if you notice, when they go, they, there's this massive investment in lots and lots of eggs. And so they hedge their bet that they're going to get the next round. They grow real fast. Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, that's nice too for us because it's, it's a much more sustainable fishery. Unlike orange roughy, which is a deep sea fish, they have really big eggs too, but they live at 800 to 1200 meters down. No predators there. They're over a hundred years old, well over a hundred years old, at least they used to be. So they went in, fished them out in uh, New Zealand and Australia, fished them out in 10 years. And, and they're like, well, where are all the fish? Well, you, you cut down the old growth forest, right? You can't take all the trees and expect them to be back there in 10 years, right? Yeah. Yeah, I believe the, uh, the basis of uh, the annular growth rings in, in coral is, uh, is seasonal changes in yeah. and or temperature. Right. Uh, because they are essentially crop trophic organisms. You know, right. To their, their but what is the basis of annualization in the fish? What's yeah. They have growth bands? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, like Opakapaka is a good example. There's no zones there you can really count. Uh, and it's probably because they're sort of here in the subtropics and maybe they're not getting those strong environmental cues like the, the yellow eye rockfish I showed you. It just looked like a redwood tree. Seasonal signals in the temperate zones are really strong. Um, so there may be, there's, you know, circadian rhythms and stuff like that that actually, uh, you know, create zones. Um, there's a lot of diff other different things that they can respond to. But in the tropics, it's a little more tricky. What is the size, the smallest and the largest of the that we talked about? Yeah. Some of them are really, really small. So the reef fish tend to have the really small ones. So that the bumphead parrotfish, you know, it's a big fish. It's all, it was about the size of a dime or half a dime maximum. And that's for a huge fish. Um, the opakapaka -opaka has, has quite big otoliths. Um, so there's, there's kind of a continuum. Uh, some of them are real thin and glassy and well, like, um, the, uh, otolith of Marlin are tiny, huge 1200 pound Marlin has this little thing that's about five milligrams 
Um, I'm hope and I'm hoping to sample it eventually once we can get the error bars down and the precision up. Um, so it it covers a big range. There's a really big range. Yeah. Yeah. What function do overlets serve? They um, for hearing one. So they vibrate. They sit in the they sit in the little sacks in their ears and they basically give them orientation as well. Um, but that's basically it. Yes, yeah, is hearing and orientation. We have them in our ears, but they're archaic. They're, they're sort of sitting on top of the little bundles of, of fibers. Yeah. One quick question about yeah. the, the really big bombs, like the H bombs. Yeah. Did they, did they drop them from a plane, or were they on a small island? So that first one, the Ivy Mike event in 1952, that was a purely theoretical device. It was, a, it was in a warehouse. So that thing was not a deliverable unit. Uh, they had to cool it to keep things uh, together. Yeah. And once they found that they could do that, then they started getting things down smaller and smaller. Uh, eventually, um, the first airdrop was George. Um, they were they, they're able to drop smaller ones, but you started getting a tens of 20s megatons and it gets difficult. Russia dropped the Tsar bomb, which was a 20 ton device. And it was fit that was 50 55 megatons they were afraid that plane wouldn't even be able to get away so they painted it white with reflective paint so that it as it dove away as it, as it blew up the radiation would it actually fried the paint a little bit as it when it got back to the base so they were afraid they were going to lose those guys actually but so so yeah so yeah some of them are deliverable and now that we have really great ballistic missiles and so on you know that we can launch things like that and it's kind of scary I've got papers up there in front if you guys want a copy of any of the papers that if you have trouble sleeping at night, you know, <laughs> have a long trip. <laughs> Is the zombie one up there? Yeah, the zombie papers are. <laughs> okay.